Hallelujah. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. This is the fifth Sunday of Easter, remember? Okay. Um, yeah, we're in this uh, season of Easter tide. And I first want to say good morning and thank all of you for your prayers and cards and well wishes for my little stages of recovery. And, you know, praise God and the God's merciful, God is healing, and God blesses you with things like emu oil cream that help. Wow. So really all those things have set me on a good course. And you know, it's really funny because it's probably been at least a year since I've been invited to be a speaker. So when Pastor Brenda invited me, you know, three, four weeks ago, I said, well, yeah, I think it, it's time. And I immediately thought, oh, you know, I somehow I want to share bike riding in this sermon. <laughs> uh, and um, so then I started reading about the scriptures, the vine, and I, um, then 10 days ago I have this accident and I fall off the bike. And you might think that's, that's kind of unusual, but actually, I'm the type of writer, I'm, I'm very practical, you know. I started writing maybe seriously a year ago and I said, you know, one of these days, I'm gonna fall. It's just inevitable, right? You ride a bike, everybody falls. So bingo, there it happens, 10 days ago. And so I'm saying, I'm, I'm going into ER and I'm saying, you know, did God really want me to talk about bike riding in this sermon? <laughs> maybe, maybe not, but anyway, I'm going for it, and um, I'm inviting you to come along for the ride. So, let us invite the Spirit of God in prayer. God of Easter, of springtime, and of resurrection, God of all that is coming again into new life, thank you for being here with us in this very room in each of our hearts and beings. Let us each breathe you in deeply. As we sit, as we listen, as we let go of self and find new life in you this very morning. Amen. Okay, so it is springtime. I mean, this weather is just gorgeous, right? It's bike riding weather. Um, I apologize to those of you who suffer from allergies because I know it's not fun, but personally, I do love springtime. It's one of my favorite times, right, Lily? We get out in the garden, we trim, we plant, we see all the flowers. Wow, yesterday, Jessica comes over and she's helping me and she says, well, what's that flower over there? And I says, Oh my gosh, that is the first time this plant has bloomed since I planted these little rhizomes, maybe four or five years ago. It's the peony, wow. right, from Asia. And so in order to get established, it takes four or five years. But this is the reward. This is God's blessing, right, when we are patient. So in thinking about the vine and its branches, um, have you been out to any vineyards lately, or maybe they're growing around your house? Uh, <laughs> it depends where you live, right? Have you been, uh, uh, I was out in Sonol a few weeks ago, or even Cull Canyon, which is right in Castro Valley. There are vineyards, and maybe two months ago, they looked like dead rootstock, right? They're just dead branches strung on these uh, wires. And then you go back again, and Boom, they're full of green, luscious leaves. And you know that later this summer, if we get enough water, you're gonna get the fruits of the vine. So if you'd like to follow along in your pew Bibles, we are looking at John chapter 15. And I'm just gonna kinda jump around those few verses uh, one through eight. So John chapter 15. One through eight. He starts with verse one. 
I am the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. So here Jesus brings a metaphor that the people of his time are going to understand, because many of them are probably agricultural people, right? Growing um, the fruits of the land. And Jesus says, I am the vine, and God is the vine dresser. God is the one who tends to the vine, who prunes it and nourishes it. Why? For the purpose of bearing fruit, right? What good is a vine if there's only leaves, no fruit? And you know, um, I don't know how many of you have been watching your watering of your gardens, but as I have, I'm kind of picking and choosing which of those plants I really, really, really want to save if we really have to cut back. And it's actually the ones that bear fruit. It's the, the fruit trees and anything that um, is going to give me a, a good produce. But I, I still love flowers, too. Anyway, verse 5, Jesus says it again. I am the vine, you are the branches. Now just think of that. What a privilege it is for each of us to be a part of this vine, a part of Jesus, intimately connected with him, drawing our life from the vine. Because who is this vine? None other than the begotten son of the creator. Picture a strong root, a vigorous vine, and many, many, many sprouting branches. That's you and I. We're connected to Christ, not by our merit, our own merit, not by anything we've done, but we're connected because of what God has done for us. God who loved us from the very beginning in spite of our own sinful nature, and who extends that love richly and abundantly and unconditionally. Jesus is the vine, and we are nourished by God's immense love because we're connected to Jesus. Now, verse 4 uses a very important verb to describe that connection. What's the verb? Uh, different translations, but... What does yours say? Verse 4, abide. abide. Thank you. Now, that's not a word you use a lot every day, right? But I like the translation. Well, okay, if I look at Webster's in the dictionary, abide is to stay, to remain, to reside in. And I like um, Peterson's translation in the message, which says, live in me. Make your home in me, just as I do in you. I just love that image. Jesus has already made his home in us. He set up space right in our own beings, as this flesh and blood body. And, of course, we're more than flesh and blood, right? We're spirit and we're soul. And Jesus is there within us. And the next part, though, says, make your home in me, make your home in me. That's our part. Have we made our home in Jesus as Jesus has made his home in us? Mm. We have work to do. This is not talking about a casual connection. Jesus is not someone we just give a nod to on Sunday mornings or every now and then when we happen to think of him. This has to do with drawing our real life and breath from Jesus. Because when you know someone intimately, you cannot help but be changed by knowing that person. That person influences how you think and speak and act. Something like falling in love, right? Remember that? Or you have that to look forward to? <laughs> So have we consciously accessed Jesus' love in our own center, the center of our thoughts and actions? Have we planted our wishes and our wills firmly in his hands? And do we call on Jesus to breathe into the words we speak to others, into the choices we make every day in our lives? 
I think that's what it means to abide in the vine. The branches have to draw their nutrients, their water, everything they need to produce fruit by being connected to the vine. For what does it say? Apart from him, we are nothing. But with him, the potential for us to do good is boundless. So what does it say about the fruit? Verse 2, so I'm kind of skipping back and forth. Verse 2 says, branches that don't bear fruit will be cut off or pruned. Now, if you have fruit trees, I hope you have taken time to prune them. Because actually, what does that do? It gets you a better harvest. It's not a bad thing at all. Cutting back a big, long, leggy branch is going to force many more new branches to come forth. And it allows more light to open up, to reach into those areas that need it. Kind of a neat trick. You cut back so you'll have more. I think God's saying to us, let's prune those parts, those parts of us that may have become unproductive or negative or things that maybe block the light, the light of God's Son reaching us. Anything that causes up to us to have a barrier between God's love and us. Hmm. I want you to take a moment just to think silently of what in your own life might need pruning. Just maybe close your eyes for half a minute. What might God be saying to you is, is a barrier or has become unproductive? Okay, it's, it's hard work, isn't it? Naming those things. Sometimes we don't want to admit that we need pruning, that we need to change, that there are some parts of us that maybe are hindering the growth of God's kingdom. But you know, that's where this community of faith plays a role. Our small groups, our connections to one another, the things that happen outside of Sunday worship. Connections to the vine with our brothers and sisters in Christ is essential because then that's where we find God's truths for our lives. Stay connected to Christ. Stay connected to with Christ's body, which is each one of us, each one of the believers here in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, wherever we find connections with other Christians. Abide in me, live in me, make your home in me, just as I do in you. If those are the only words you remember from today's sermon, that may be enough. So now I'm going to digress here and I'm going to talk to you about cycling, okay? Um, you do want to know how I got these beautiful colors on my face. <laughs> uh, and connecting scripture to real life is it's kind of important. I like Yeah, you like that? Okay, so in the past year, I became a cyclist. Isn't that a great word? It sounds cool. Not a biker, because that could be motors, uh, motorcycles. And that's not it. Okay, but a cycler. And, um, you know, I had this bike that hung on my wall. I think the boys, that's Ben and Jamie, built it for me almost 10 years ago. Right? I almost want to think. I've been retired for nine, no, no, since 2009. That's only six years. But I think you built it before I retired. You know, they go on Craigslist. They buy these bike parts. And I hear this is really nice bike because I know nothing about them. And people say, 
ooh, that's a titanium bike. That's really nice. Wow. Uh, they put on good parts, good brakes. And so, you know, I really felt guilty. I was going like three times a year, taking the bike down, riding over to Lake Chabot. Uh, that's like eight miles come home, and then it hangs back on the wall. And every time I get on it, I, I forget how to use the gears. You know, I got to go over it. Um, and those little skinny tires, they kind of scared me. So I was just uh, this occasional rider. So last year, you know, God has a way of working in our lives. Sometimes it's through um, things that uh, are not exactly happy. But last year, um, Al's niece, a young lady in her 40s, came down with breast cancer. She's diagnosed, and so she's, you know, surgery, treatments, everything. And Ben says, well, you know, what can we do to support her? He says, oh, why don't we do this bike ride? It's for cancer research, um, sponsored by Stanford. So we gather some friends. You only need five people to form a team. We formed this team for the Canary Challenge. And this friend of mine and I, we are, we're going to do 50 kilometers. That's 32 miles. And Ben, I think, is doing the 100K, right? So it's 65 miles with his friends. And so now realize that's actually three to four times longer than I usually ride. So I'm not a slacker. I said, you know, I got to get out there. I got to train. It mostly happened after I came back from Kumi, which was in June. And I said, oh yeah, I got to start every, uh, you know, every week getting out on this bike. So I do, and I really find it's fun. I'm going along the marina in San Leandro. It's beautiful. You see the shoreline, the birds. Um, then we go to Calistoga, Sausalito, Santa Cruz, and then right home we have this kind of ugly path. It's called the Dublin Grade. So you're going out to Dublin and back, but there's a bike lane, so it's, it's really nice. And then the event took place, uh, the ride in Menlo Park uh, in September. It was good. It was beautiful. Good weather, and you know there's about eight, nine hundred riders. But because it's all spread out and the hardcore riders start earlier, you don't feel crowded at all. Sometimes you only see one or two riders, and then you hear this little swarm coming up, and like this whole group of riders goes swoosh, but then they're gone, they're past you, and you're just plugging along, and, and it's great. And I slept really well that night, and they give you good food. We had Chairman Bao's, uh, food truck, but the next day I wake up and for about four to five days after that, I got sore shoulders. And I said, you know what, that's not right. Just because I rode my bike a little longer, why are my so shoulders all sore? So I thought about it, I must be doing something wrong. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, it must be, I'm tensing up on the way I'm riding. Because, um, especially on the downhills, I get scared. So that's when you know you're, you're like gripping the brakes and you're all hunched over. And so going 32 miles, and it's not all downhill, but it's just enough that, wow, that really um, impacted my shoulders. So I said, I need to correct that. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop fighting the bicycle. I need to let go of my fear. I need to relax a little. I need to trust the bike more. And I actually say, I need to become one with the bike. <laughs> that's really, that's my, my image. You know, you see those riders, they're all bent over, right? They're like hugging the bike. They got their, their arms resting on the handlebars. They're not even holding the handlebars. Oh, oh I'm not near that. But I decide, especially when I'm coasting downhill, I've got to loosen up. And so I start focusing on it. And I've never had that problem again of sore shoulders, whether I'm you know, doing 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles. Sometimes I do a 40-mile ride now just for fun. 
So, remember the vine? Abide in the vine. Live in me. Become one with Jesus. That's how we bear fruit. Our lives were meant to be connected to the Creator, the one who shows endless compassion and mercy to others. When we try to do it by ourselves, to let ego become our master, to cling to choices of fear, selfishness, to cling to old habits that might interfere with us growing in Christ, then we need to be pruned. We need to be reminded to be called into a new way of being, the being called love. It's the same for this church. Sometimes we think we're not growing. Hmm, maybe yes, maybe no. But we need to ask ourselves, what is God telling us needs, that needs to be pruned? And what is it that God might be calling us to do that is new, that is different? Where might Jesus be sending us to be God's hands and feet? With whom should we be connecting? And if God has given us resources of time, gifts, money, a building, how would Jesus want us to share these with others? Hmm. Okay, lots to think of it. Now, how did I end up with this nice black eye and a fractured shoulder if I was one with a bite? Oh. So, 10 days ago, I do that lovely ride to Alameda, and we're, we're just about home. I'm with my friend. I have this bike buddy. And we're only two miles from home, and we're on East 14th Street. So if you know East 14th Street, it's, you know, two lanes and a divider down the middle, two lanes on each side. And in traffic, I have to admit, that's when I get a little bit nervous. So we're supposed to make this left turn to go up to Castro Valley Boulevard. And I, I'm thinking, I'm going to the traffic light, and I'm going to um, stop at the crosswalk, and I'm going to push the button, the pedestrian button, that lets you cross the street. But my buddy just moves over two lanes and says, oh, I think we should get ready and do the left turn here. And ah, I said, oh, OK. So I'm, I'm looking over my shoulder, but I'm, I'm really scared. I look over two times. I'm over in the next lane, but I kind of realize that I've oversteered my handlebars are turned way too much to the left, and the bike is starting to lean over. And at that point, I should have just unclipped my shoes from the bike and caught myself, but I didn't. I tried to right myself up uh, on this bike that's already fallen over, and so that's the story. Um, I, I think I had slowed down too much, and I had oversteered. The helmet was a, a big save. So was I one with the bike? <laughs> well, we did all fall over together. But did I listen to what my bike was saying to me? I think not, right? If I had listened to it and said it was saying, you know, you're falling, you need to catch yourself, the outcome might have been different. And actually, Ben taught me later that the way you should look back is you don't hold on to the handlebars and go like this because there's only so far you can turn your neck. You gotta let go of one hand and turn your body back. And I have seen bikers do that, but I have not really gotten to the point where I was comfortable doing that. So you see there's a constant learning going on. And that's exactly what God is telling us as individuals, as a church. We need to be looking at what we're doing are we sometimes so fearful that we're always looking back but forgetting to pay attention also to the movement forward? Are we afraid to step out of our comfort zone? Mm. Are we afraid to risk? Do we forget to abide in Jesus and God's word? 
that they will be with us no matter where we travel, even when we're not sure where the outcome will be. God doesn't call us to always play it safe, to always stick to what we've done before. God doesn't promise us smooth, pain-free sailing. Life is not that way. Jesus lived a life that shook the religious establishment. Go to Pastor Moon's class and you'll find out about it. So today, with our problems of hunger, of poverty, of disasters, of racial tensions, terrorism, mistakes man-made and non-man-made. How can we still move forward and live into building the kingdom that Jesus exemplified, where the last shall become first and the lion should lie down with the lamb? Abide in the vine. Live in me just as I live in you. May it be so. Amen.